I am absolutely delighted to have a chance to talk about this incredibly important topic with the wonderful Yuval Harari, who I think, frankly, needs almost no introduction. I'm sure most of you had read Sapiens, Homo Deus, Unstoppable Us, his books. Um, he's currently sold 45 million books in 65 languages around the world, which is an astonishing track record. But aside from being an expert on what it means to be human um, and how the concept of humanity and the nature of humanity has evolved over the millennium, he's professor of history at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and he's also someone who's been very involved in social issues. Um, he's founded, co-founded the social impact company Sapenship, and he's been at the forefront of people campaigning in Israel to try and stop the um, drift towards authoritarianism, for which I deeply applaud you. So, an amazing mind, very committed to trying to do good in the world, um, and has increasingly been vocal about AI, penning a very strong op-ed with Tristan Harris, who you just heard earlier this year, warning about its dangers, giving speeches warning about the dangers, and being generally extremely alarmed about what's going on. What makes you so concerned about AI right now, about the nature of being human? Hmm. I think AI is fundamentally different from anything we've seen previously in history, from every previous invention, whether it's nuclear weapons, whether it's the printing press or radio or anything else. There are really two things that everybody should know about AI. AI is the first tool in history that can make decisions by itself, and it's the first tool in history that can create new ideas by itself. Atom bombs could not make decisions. The decision to bomb Hiroshima was in the end taken by a human being, by President Truman. Um, so all these previous inventions, they empowered humans. Now we have we created something that can take power away from us, that can make decisions instead of us, and can also create new ideas. So potentially we are talking about the end of human history, not the annihilation of the human species, not the end of history, just the end of the, that part of history which was dominated by human beings, by human ideas. And we live cocooned inside a culture created by human beings. Everything we think, we feel, has been shaped by stories, by images, by poems, by tools that were created by human minds. Now, there is something that can create poems and images and tools which is not human. It's an alien intelligence and it has remarkable abilities. It's very likely that in the next few years it will basically eat up all of human culture Everything we've created for tens of thousands of years since the Stone Age, it will uh, 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 absorb it, digest it, and start spewing out a new culture coming from an alien intelligence. What would that do, not just to the world outside us, but to the world inside us, to our psychology, to our religions, to our political views? Nobody knows. So all the things they talk about AI training itself on the data that's out there, it could actually end up training itself so completely on the data, gobbling it up, that it ends up almost being the data and then training itself on its own data that it's trained on. Yes, and again, creating more and more completely new stuff. I mean, basically, humans do the same thing. Right. When I come to write a book, when somebody comes to write music, we don't start from scratch. We, yes. we, we, train ourselves, we absorb books or music that people composed before us, and then we change something, we add something. AI is the same. And in certain ways, it can be far more creative than human beings, because humans and all other animals, we are organic beings. So even our imagination, in the end, is limited by organic biochemistry. And here we have a non-organic intelligence it can uh, uh, create and think in radically different ways. So one way some people think about it 
is really like an alien invasion. Like if I were to tell people, look, there is, we know, we, our telescopes have discovered a fleet of alien spaceships coming from the planet Zircon with al intelligent aliens on them. They'll be here right. in, say, five years and take over the planet, but maybe they are nice. They will solve cancer, they will uh, uh, solve climate change, but they will take the power to control the world and our future from us. Right. Most people will be terrified. So this is the scenario we are talking about, right. with the single exception that this alien intelligence, it's not coming from planet Zircon in spaceships, mm. it's coming from California. So if, we had, <laughs> so if we had E.T. read Made Today, the movie, instead of having a little boy looking at the sky and pointing to outer space aliens, um, E.T. should be set in California pointing to Microsoft, Google... To the, to the screen. To the screen, to yes. The screen. It's coming from there. Or Sam Altman. We should have Sam Altman <laughs> arriving in the spaceship, um, threatening us all, or I'm going to come back to that in a moment. But, um, but I'm, I'm very curious... Is there anything we can do to stop this? I mean, are you in mm. the camp that says we should simply stop AI no. development? I mean, Put it under government control? I mean, how do we stop it? We can still do something about it. Otherwise, there is no point wasting people's time talking about it. Right. No, if, if it's doom and there is nothing to do, why talk about it? If you want to go to Elon Musk's, um, Elon Musk's you know, <laughs> rocket to Mars and try and or stay there. Or something, yes. Yeah. I, I wouldn't go there definitely, but yes. Um, and... We can't just stop the development of the technology. This won't happen. But we need to make two distinctions. First of all, between development and deployment. The, the fact that you develop a technology doesn't mean you have to deploy it. And secondly, that you can deploy the technology and also develop the technology in many different ways. You can use the same technology for different purposes. So again, you look at the 20th century, you see the same technology of the Industrial Revolution, whether it's trains or radio or whatever, used to build totalitarian regimes and liberal democracy. You look at North Korea and South Korea, so you have, I don't know, these K-pop bands in, in, in South Korea, and you have these people with big hats and nuclear weapons in North Korea. So you can, same people, same geography, same history, same technological opportunities, very different uh, applications. So we can still, we have a few years, I don't know how many years, right. five years, 10 years, 30 years, that we are still in the driver's seat right. before AI pushes us to the back seat. And we should use these years to think very carefully and quickly about how, not stopping it, it's impossible to just stop it, but how to direct it in, good, in, in, in a good direction. Because you've thrown out some very interesting ideas. I mean, one of them is that tech companies should spend 20% of their profits on investing in ways to make AI safer. Um, that's an idea that already OpenAI has taken yeah, up. So I, I would focus on two things. First of all, we need institutions. That we cannot regulate this just by trying to envision all the different dangerous scenarios and then getting the parliaments and, and, and the governments to pass th some regulation. Mm. It's too rigid. We need living institutions which have a lot of resources, which have some of the best people in the field, and which are constant communication with the communities affected by AI, because very often the communities know better than anybody else, and we need these institutions to react on the fly. So the, the big task is building institutions, not just passing a, a particular regulations, the big difficulty with institutions is how to gain the public trust. Of course, we need resources, so say a 20% uh, tax on any revenue or investment from AI in order to finance these safety institutions, that's important, but we need to gain the public's trust. And therefore, also in addition to these, you know, like 500 pages regulations mm. that nobody can, uh, uh, no kind of uh, layperson can understand or read, we need to be very, work with artists, work with uh, uh, people who understand communication to make sure that everybody is on board, that they understand what is happening. So there is a role, say, for sci-fi creators <coughs> to communicate to the public in an accessible way what is happening and what should be done. Right. And the policies, again, in many cases, we don't need to invent the wheel. 
We just need to take the uh, 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 wisdom that humanity accumulated for thousands of years and apply it to this new situation. So one very, very clear and old uh, uh, regulation is don't steal. You know, people thought about don't steal thousands of years ago. Now, many of the tech giants of today, their business model is, is really based on stealing our data. Mm. But, and, and the trick is to say, this is not stealing. If it's online, it's digital, so stealing, it's not stealing. So very simple, so no. Even if it's online digital data, this is still stealing. You cannot take my data and do with it whatever you want as if it's yours. Right. Similarly, another again very clear regulation. You need a 500-page law mm. to, to specify it, but to convey to the public very clear regulation that you cannot counterfeit humans. Right. Ban fake humans. Again, if we allow AI to masquerade as human beings, so you go online and you communicate with someone, you have no idea whether it's a human being or whether it's an AI, this will destroy trust and this will destroy democracy. But there is an antidote, just very the same way that in the financial system. It's easy technologically to counterfeit money, mm. but if you do that, you go to jail for like 20, 30 years, should be the same with counterfeiting humans. And it should also be emphasized that you hear a lot of voices in Silicon Valley, libertarian voices, saying, but what about freedom of speech? And it should be very, very clear that bots don't have freedom of speech. Humans have it. So say banning a human being from speaking in social media, that's a very difficult and, and dangerous move. We have to think about it carefully. Yeah. But banning the bots, that's a very simple and easy step, which is not being done. So those are three very practical ideas. Don't give bots freedom, freedom of speech. Don't let um, tech companies counterfeit humans without, you know, they have to mark them as AI up yes. front. And that point is particularly important with the elections and the potential for man manipulation in the forthcoming elections. And then create some institutions, hopefully funded by the enormous revenues coming out of tech. So those are three very practical, very, very good ideas. Are any of those being adopted or do you have any hope they will be adopted? Because, mm -hmm. of course, you know, we have Rishi Sunak, the British um, prime minister, who's due to have this big summit with the Americans quite soon to try and create joint transatlantic frameworks for regulations. Has there any of them come to you and said, we'd like to learn from the wisdom of, of a historian and have you on stage and tell Rishi and Joe what to do? I, I mean, several things. Or has and Elon Musk come and asked you what he, what, what he thinks you should do? Uh, Elon didn't, but I, I'm, on, I'm in several think tanks. And I'm, again, uh, there are lots of people trying to push forward these and other initiatives. And I hope that we adopt at least some of them as soon as possible, and because time is of the essence. We just don't have much time. Yeah. And in terms of the, sort of the other dangers that you see, um, you know, I, as I said, I was just in Ukraine last week. Um, one of the things that's happening there under the pressure of war is that the Ukrainians are racing to innovate and put AI into drones. Mm -hmm. And you're really having the first example in history of drone-on-drone -drone warfare yeah. and potentially two sets of AI-controlled drones you know, doing battle with each other. One of the ironic concerns that some of the developers have is that if they use AI in too predictable a way that's the same as the Russian AI, they'll simply end up doing the same thing as each other all the time and it won't work. Mm -hmm. Are you concerned, though, about the specter of this kind of, you know, science fiction apocalypse image of the robots taking over and killing us all soon? Yeah, I mean, this is like the, the most basic science fiction scenario, and we are heading in that direction. And it's difficult to see how you stop that. Because other things, you can do a coalition of the willing and say, ban the bots in the West, and if Russia doesn't want to ban the bots on, on its uh, internet, then that's their problem. But when it comes to producing autonomous weapon systems, as long as you have one player who, who, who goes forward with it, nobody else would be willing or even able to, to, to stay behind. So here we have a very big problem. But again, we, we're looking at Ukraine, uh, we are facing the rise of new totalitarian regimes in different parts of the world. 
Uh, I strongly believe that the Ukrainians are fighting not just for their survival and freedom. In many ways, they are fighting for the freedom of the whole of Europe and of, of the whole world. So we have to give them as, as much support as, as we can. This is really the, the front line of, of the fight for freedom right now. And when yeah, you and look... the fight that goes across to Israel right now as well. Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. Yes. And when you look at the, at the rise of these new regimes, many of these regimes, they are counting on AI to solve the problem that totalitarianism faced in the 20th century. Because in the 20th century, the dreams of, total, of complete control of everybody, they, in the end, they came against technical problems. If you're thinking about the USSR, if you yeah. live in Kiev during the Soviet times... I was in the Soviet Union. I lived in the Soviet Union. Yeah, yes. so, so, so you know um, that technically, even though the people in the Kremlin wanted they couldn't follow everybody all the time. They could not destroy human privacy completely because yeah. you have 200 million citizens in the Soviet Union. Now, to follow everybody all the time, you need at least 200 million KGB agents. You don't have 200 million KGB agents. Yes. Even if you do, then what they do, they, they follow you around all day. At the end of the day, they write a paper report. You went there, you spoke with this person, you read this book. Then it's 200 million paper reports sent yeah. every day to KGB headquarters. Nobody can process it. They don't have the data analysts. So even in the Soviet Union, it was technically impossible to follow everybody all the time. Yes. Now it is possible. You don't need KGB agents, human agents, to follow people around. You have uh, the digital agents. We carry them in our pockets. The smartphones, the cameras, it's everywhere. Yeah. So you can technically follow everybody all the time. And you don't need human analysts to go over the data. This is where AI Having comes AI. in. Yeah, it's so, a terrifying prospect. So it's really. now possible to create total surveillance regimes that follow everybody all the time, that know much more about me than I know about myself. Yes. And there are regimes that are going in that direction. So in the last minute, Give us one reason to feel cheerful, hmm. if you have any. Yes. I, again, I think we, we are From the still, sweep of many millennia. We, yeah. we, we still have a few years to change, to, to control the direction this is going. And AI is nowhere near its full potential, but human beings are also nowhere near our full potential. After tens of thousands of years, we still don't understand ourselves very well. We still don't understand our minds. There is huge space to develop our own minds and capabilities also, if for every dollar and minute that we spend on developing artificial intelligence, we spend another dollar and minute in developing our own consciousness, our own minds, we will be okay. <laughs> well, as someone who initially trained as a cultural anthropologist in the Soviet Union before I became a journalist, um, I've long said that to make AI work, we need to not just artificial intelligence, but artificial intelligence plus anthropology intelligence creates augmented intelligence. AI plus AI equals the right type of AI. Mm. So I strongly applaud it. Um, I hope that your call to arms will be listened to. I very much salute what you're doing in Israel right now. And I look forward to what I predict will be the next book <laughs> coming soon on all this. So thank you very much indeed. Can we have a big applause, please, for thank the wonderful you. Yuval?